it's a little hard to see everybody in this, uh, in this setup, but you can see us. Mike's working okay. Can you hear us? Yeah. Maybe a little bit? Okay, great. Good afternoon. Uh, no. No. How about that? Okay, now I hear myself. Okay. Welcome to our fifth and final uh, forum on PARC. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the members of the board who are here uh, for this hearing. It's our pleasure to be at Springfield Technical Community College. I know we're going to hear from the president in a minute, but thank you for having us. Um, our custom at all of our meetings is for board members present to introduce themselves, so we'll start down at uh, my right or left with uh, Member Stewart. Thank you. Mary Ann Stewart, Lexington. Jim Pizer, Secretary of Education. Mitchell Chester, Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education. Ed Doherty, Boston. James Wharton, Springfield, Boston. Thank you to the members for uh, joining me uh, today. Um, this is the fifth of our hearings. Uh, I think you're probably all aware, but I'll just set some ground rules and uh, provide a little explanation. Um, we made these uh, open sessions. We have invited uh, expert testimony in the beginning section. We have uh, tried to group that testimony around specific uh, themes as best we could, but based on dates and geography, um, some of it comes a little bit uh, out of order. Uh, then members of the public can sign up. Uh, if you wanted to speak, you needed to fill out a card when you came in, um, and then we will take people in order there. You can. Uh, uh, testify in any aspect of, of park that, that you would like, but we certainly ask that you restrict your testimony to the topic of, of these board hearings. Um, you can also submit uh, your testimony, or if you have more things to say than time will allow, uh, in writing to staff uh, in the front row here. Um, that way, uh, that material as well as notes they're taking will get shared with members of the board who couldn't be here uh, today. Um, we will begin with uh, the testimony from invited guests. Uh, the format is those guests uh, are invited to speak for up to five minutes. When there's 30 seconds left in their time, they will hear a signal, probably one that no one likes to hear. Uh, when you hear that, please wrap up in 30 seconds. Uh, we reserve the right to ask you questions, um, which you can decide to answer or not answer, but that time will come from us, not from the time allotted. When we move to the general public, we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. Again, you'll hear that buzzer when you have about 30 seconds left. Please wrap up. And we may or may not have uh, questions uh, for you. Um, also, just uh, for efficiency's sake, I will call two to three speakers at a time. Please come, speak in the order I called you, but stay through the panel so it's not disruptive, and then we'll shift to another one again that just moves things uh, along. Uh, I hope we can get through everyone who has signed up because this is our last so we're going to start uh, today with um, some remarks from Ira oh. Rubenzahl. Rubenzahl. Rubenzahl, thank you. There it's written out and I can read it. Ira Rubenzahl, thank you. Uh, I know I, sh I, I mangle names constantly with these things. I apologize, I shouldn't do that for the host. Uh, and I think also Vanessa Hill is here with you today. Yes. So thank you for having us. Um, thank you for the facility and the hospitality. And um, please proceed. Yes, welcome to our campus. Uh, which was uh, actually established in 1793 by George Washington as the Springfield Armory. Uh, it's really the only historic campus in Massachusetts that's a, both a national cultural site, a national historic site, and uh, we struggle with, uh, with uh, the buildings that we have. We moved here in 1968, and I like to say we've been moving in ever since. Um, I wanted to um, speak on behalf of the uh, 15 community college presidents about PARC and our hope and expectation that it will improve the uh, quality and readiness of students that come to us. As you know, many of the students who come to us are not college ready and creates a tremendous burden for us to try to get them to uh, college level in uh, English and mathematics. Uh, Professor Hill will talk a little bit about mathematics after I speak. Um, we hope that PARC represents and we think it does represent a higher and more appropriate standard for college and career readiness. Teams of college and K-12 faculty prepared the PARC test. We were involved, making it a more reliable assessment instrument for bridging the high school to college experience. Implementation of PARC will provide the potential for even greater curriculum alignment. We think that's positive, particularly between and among high schools and the public colleges and universities. And I would hope that maybe you could include the private 
at universities and colleges also in this process. Park will reduce the number of students requiring developmental education. That's, our, that's your expectation and our expectation. It will allow the colleges to reduce the number and amount of resources in, in, that we use for the ACCUPLACER test, which is a test we use to place students in uh, college or developmental work. And we hope it will only require one test for a transition from high school to college instead of two, that one test being the Park test. Um, and we hope that it will not water down Park uh, because we think that, it, that there was some experience with MCAS by creating an additional category uh, that was not helpful to us. Let me just say a little bit about MCAS. Um, there was a study by the Department of uh, Higher Education a number of years ago, thousands of students who come to the community colleges. And what they basically found is that students who place on uh, the highest level of MCAS place directly almost almost entirely into college level work. But students were placed on the needs improvement level were placed into the developmental work. So the MCAS was not producing, students were passing the MCAS, but it was not producing students that could come to us who were really college ready. Um, I just want to say one other remark about uh, the contours of uh, K through 12 public education and our relationship to it in the Commonwealth. Um, you know, we have in the Commonwealth, and, and, and the politicians, rightly so, brag about we have the highest NAEP scores in the nation. But we also have, by a number of measures, some of the lowest achievements by African Americans and Latinos. So I was looking at this report. It is a few years old. Lost Opportunity, a 50-state report uh, by the Schott Foundation, um, which is located in Cambridge, Mass. And according to this report, now that, uh, the data is six years old. We were last, Massachusetts was last in Latino achievement coming out of high school and Latino um, opportunities to be in high, high uh, performing high schools. We were 13th from the bottom for African American students and we were last for low income students. So although we have a great public K through 12 system, it is not serving all of our students. And many of those students come to us with tremendous needs. So just for example at STCC, 45% and growing of our students are either Latino or African American. The city of Springfield is now 74% of the public school students in, in Springfield are Latino. And we need to help these students be more successful if they're going to be able to get decent careers and decent jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just to add to what President Rubenthal said, um, we have, depending on your data, between 60 and 80% of our students test into developmental math. And a big problem with that is they are actually running out of money before they actually get to any college level courses. They, they come in and they're testing into arithmetic, which is a pre-algebra course. That means they have three levels of developmental education before they can hit college level. We find that students are changing their majors because of the math, and it seems to be so daunting that they feel like they come to a community college, it's a two-year school, and you don't really get out in two years. And, and they really have been deterred from it. So we're trying to do things on our end by introducing careers into our developmental classes, by trying to shorten the developmental sequence and do as much as we can. But it's not unheard of for a student to come in and take a placement test, the AccuPlacer, and they've had pre-calculus in high school and they test into arithmetic. And they're very like upset about it and discouraged with it. And a part of the problem is those basic number of facts. If you take the AccuPlacer test, and I'm not sure how much you know about it, um, from the beginning they ask you a very basic algebra and then they dump you right into arithmetic where there's no calculator and most people can't add fractions anymore without a calculator. It's probably been years since even high school graduates have done it. And doing percentages by paper and pencil and things like that. So the AccuPlacer is testing things very different the alignment from what's coming out of K through 12 and the AccuPlacer exam, there's a really big disconnect. So we're hoping that, again, how President Rubenthal said that they're not taking these two very different tests and that the students are actually prepared for this college level work. Um, we're really lacking in students for especially our STEM disciplines and we really need to bolster that map and make it a lot more stringent so that they can actually get into some of these more lucrative careers. So we're trying to work on it on our end. Um, we've met with high schools and middle schools, our department and the college in general, and we want to continue to do that to make sure there's a better alignment. But there definitely is a very 
big need for our students to come in to the college to be prepared so that they can meet their goals and not be discouraged before they um, stop out is what happens to a lot of them. That's all I have. So I did have a question because PARC is not a framework and it's not curriculum. Just testing kids with a different test, I get what I think I hear you say is it might give a more honest view of how they're doing and it might reveal the disconnect in our bragging about being the best when we also have some of the worst results um, in the country. Are you just hoping they'll come, either not come here, or they'll come actually knowing what they don't know, or the system will have to be accountable in K through 12 to get them to the right well, level? Well, obviously the latter, but let me just say something about the math piece. I used to teach uh, mathematics uh, also. Um, what we should be doing, in my judgment, is we should be testing students in the 11th grade, their math skills, and if they're not college ready, then you have a whole year at the high school level to get them ready. I mean, and I, let me just say one other thing about the, the way the, the contours of public education in Massachusetts. It seems to me that the state has enormous cloud over a K through 12 that it doesn't necessarily exercise. I know we've got local control and you've got all these cities and towns, et cetera. But I think you could exercise more control over this issue. You have, at the city of Springfield, for example, you virtually fund the public schools. Without the state, the public schools would close. You virtually fund 100% of the public schools. So you have enormous influence, and it seems to me that you should use that to ensure that uh, there's a mechanism to do the correction and the intervention prior to the students finishing high school, rather than, we, than, 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 than having us do it when they leave high school. And it's not going to solve all the problems because we get a lot of students who don't come directly from high school. But nevertheless, I think that's the first step. They have done this in other states, by the way. I believe they've done this in Worcester where they were given Accuplacer to 11th grade. And then they had um, a special course designed and they retook it at the end of their senior year and they showed a lot of improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, Linda Noonan and Larry DeRose. Is Larry here yet? Larry is here, but Mark Harrowin cannot be here until 4 30. We, we can wait. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So Cynthia Farr Brown, Charlie Kaminsky, and Stephanie. Stephen, Sir, Sir, Sir Ricci, Stephen Sir Ricci, Sir Ricci. I'll, I'll just keep guessing. You're gonna have to help me. Sir Ricci, unless you're in Italy, doesn't see that. Too much. Okay. I'll tell you. Okay. Thank you. So please introduce yourself, where you're from, and again, I apologize on the names. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Brown. I'm the interim president of the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, which is the Commonwealth's public liberal arts college, part of the state university system. And for the past three years, I've been involved with PARC coordination through the Coordinating Council, and also in my role, my day job, I'm vice president of academic affairs. Uh, I was I had the primary responsibility for oversight of the Berkshire Readiness Center initiative under Governor Patrick. Um, the work around PARC emphasizes the importance of K-12 and higher education collaboration as the shift to a deeply aligned curriculum and formative summative assessments uh, occurs and that looks ahead to college and career readiness. This work is continuing and we are heavily involved and invested in that in uh, Berkshire County. Um, we build in the county on the work of our decade-old Berkshire Compact for Education which seeks to raise the aspirations of all county residents to post-secondary education and credentialing uh, in recognition of the fact that we all know that some kind of credential or educational attainment past high school is going to be necessary in the 21st century for the majority of jobs available uh, in this state and elsewhere. We regularly convene a cross-sector group of schools, colleges, businesses, nonprofits, legislators, and community leaders to discuss big picture education issues in our county and in the state and region. Uh, ongoing readiness work happens on our public campuses and with our K-12 colleagues. We already had college and high school faculty working on math and English language arts alignment before the PARC effort began, and we have since relabeled and recast these two groups 
as two of 10 professional learning networks that we organize out of the county. And this is a bootstrap effort. Uh, we have a Berkshire County Superintendent's Roundtable representing all the public school districts in the county that uh, helps to fund this work and provide the release time and other necessary um, inducements for folks to participate. Through PARC, we have engendered a greater understanding by the higher education faculty about the K-12 standards and curriculum and how they're matched with the skills needed by students to be college ready. We've done quite a bit of outreach uh, to the uh, public entities in the county about this. Um, PARC and the work of K with K-12 in the development of assessment is focused on college readiness and placement and not on high school graduation, which we think is the appropriate set of markers. Um, and we also collaborate deeply on teacher preparation. It's certainly clear that uh, educator preparation and professional development needs to be focused on not only the revised standards and all of the back work that's being done to realign curriculum, but also on what the park assessments mean, the transition from MCAS to park if that is to occur, and then how to align uh, with college expectations and to continue, continuously have dialogue with uh, high school level educators about what it means to be college and career ready. Um, we had faculty participate in the judgment study. Uh, I heard from the faculty members who participated that it was valuable to spend time together uh, looking at draft items and considering the use of PARC engaging the prep for college level work. Uh, the math faculty in particular seemed pleased with what they were seeing. Uh, the English language arts faculty, I think it's fair to say, had more questions. Um, and we look forward to the release of the judgment study information in the near future. Using the early results to look at placement practices will be embraced by the public campuses. Uh, support for pilot evaluation and improvement of results would be appreciated. I appreciate this opportunity for testimony, and I'm here with my colleague, Charlie Kaminsky from Berkshire Community College, who, uh, and we did have an opportunity to align our remarks somewhat given our relationship, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charlie Kaminsky, and I'm the Dean for Business, Science, Math, and Technology programs at Berkshire Community College. Um, I'm also a higher ed fellow, so I've been working with PARC here in the Commonwealth for the last three years since it first started um, as a higher ed representative, um, working in Berkshire County and largely in Western Mass um, at different campuses, primarily higher ed, um, doing sessions and informing them about PARC. And uh, you know, from really the work I've done with faculty and staff members at the colleges, there's really a significant and positive change from MCAS implementation, um, which has resulted in greater buy-in and investment from the higher ed faculty and staff that I started with. 20 years ago, I started my career teaching developmental math at Middlesex Community College. And it was shocking at the time for me to see students coming in fresh out of high school that were taking courses in pre-algebra. And when I'd have conversations with colleagues at the community college, it was a mystery to them. And I think with PARC um, serving as the next step in terms of testament, uh, you know, testing for students um, for placement purposes, there's some real value to that. And there's enthusiasm and engagement, which I really haven't seen except for the last maybe three or four years in my 20 years in the system. And I think a big part of that is um, that with the case of the community colleges, you know, with the open, open door policy and open admissions, you know, we're really required to accept everyone from where they're coming in to figure out what level of coursework they need to place in. And M MCAS was not uh, a tool for that, and we all hear quite a bit around AccuPlacer and how that's also not, hasn't proven to be an appropriate or accurate tool for placement into college level. So the use of PARC is a tool not only to measure student mastery of the Common Core, but also skills for college success is an important one for higher ed, and in particular the community colleges. With careful standard setting and, setting and validation, the use of PARC will eliminate misplacement into unnecessary remedial coursework while ensuring first semester college students have the language and math skills to be successful. In the past, where high school teachers were focused on MCAS completion and college faculty were focused on performances measured by placement tests, such as AccuPlacer, PARC will merge the two concerns. And our work with the alignment with K-12, as President Brown was mentioning, is testament to that. Um, specifically, PARC can also, in addition to serving as a recognized measure of success and readiness, um, it can be used early on to identify students at risk of not being college ready 
earlier in their schooling. Um, this can inform high school to college transitions, summer bridge programs at the colleges, and also interventions appropriate to 12th grade or what would traditionally be summer school um, for students that aren't on the pathway to college readiness. And finally, another um, advantage of it has been in the dis discussions we've had on campus is that it's the high school and college faculty not just sharing testing, but also the standards and the types of test items that the students are being you know, tested with in the high schools. So the college faculty have a better sense of the curriculum and assessment tools the high school teachers are using, which has never been the case, um, in, at least in the 20 years I've been in the system. So in closing, um, I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge that uh, I think in the public side, PARC is often seen as a new effort focused around the core and, core and K-12, um, but it's much more than that in higher education. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon. My name is Steve Cerisi. I'm a professor of education at UMass Amherst. Um, and basically, I'm a testing guy. Be before I came to UMass, I worked for the GED testing service in Washington, D.C., and before that for the CPA exam. So I came to U um, UMass in 1995, so I was here for the genesis of the MCAS. And perhaps most importantly, my son, my first son was born in 1996. So I see myself as a test evaluator. We talk about standards as in curriculum standards. There are also standards for tests. So one of the things we do at UMass in the Center for Educational Assessment is evaluate tests to make sure they're adhering to standards for, uh, for professional development validation and so forth. So I've keenly been interested in the MCAS and now PARC. Uh, I've also done work for Smarter Balance. But on the other side, I'm also a parent. And um, my oldest son has been through the K-12 system, public schools in Massachusetts. I have a, a son who's a, just finished his freshman year in high school and another son who just graduated from elementary school. So I've seen the MCAS reports and I know the, the important information that they communicate. Um, so with respect to alignment, the MCAS was, was very well aligned. That's one of the things we looked at. And so when a student who graduates with a needs improvement is not yet ready for college, that, that kind of makes sense because that label was needs improvement. When I look at the process for, for what PARC is doing, because the, the standards haven't been set yet, pilot studies have been done, they've looked at a lot of other information, and PARC has made the decision to wait until they see how the, the tests actually fare before setting the final standards. To me, that adheres to best practices in, in uh, standard setting and educational test development. So I expect the, the PARC um, college readiness benchmark will be much uh, more informative than, than something like AccuPlacer. Um, at the same time, uh, I just want to acknowledge the fact that this year was historical in the history of, of educational testing in that um, for six days in a row, PARC tested a million people, a million students were tested. Um, nothing like that has ever happened before. Kind of gets lost in the, uh, in the conversations that we're having that technology uh, is something that can really improve educational assessments, can improve how information is delivered. And PARC uh, successfully you know, pulled this off across 10 different states. Smart Balance tried, they had some problems. Um, you know, there's some exciting things happening in that end too, but PARC it went off without a hitch. So um, when I think about criteria of alignment, um, some of the success that's been done with uh, computer-based testing and, and the exciting possibilities that are there, and uh, adhering to the standards for professional test development, I'm pretty, pretty happy with what PARC is. Of course, what we want to see is uh, the information coming out. Uh, it's not like we can come up with a better test and all of a sudden students are going to be college and career ready. We know that. So um, as an educational researcher, we want to see how the test results are understood and how they're used to be part of the educational process. Uh, you know, the curriculum seems to be right. We're measuring the, the, state, the college and career readiness standards we want to measure. Are the teachers uh, going to be able to, to teach to those standards and uh, will they accept them as, as important? And then uh, will that instruction lead to, to student progress? And that's what we're hoping for. Thank you. Thank you all. Linda, are you ready? We are ready. Thank All right, Linda Noonan, Larry DeRose, and Mark Kerouac. Yes. All right, come on. And if it's okay with you, I'll go first and Mark, and then I'll Any way you want. Thanks. 
morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm Linda Noonan, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education. And as most of you are familiar, MBAE had a critical role to play in the development of the Education Reform Act of 1993. We remain, 20 plus years later, committed to high standards and to accountability that will prepare all of our students to compete and to engage successfully in a very competitive global economy and society. We also realize, though, that time doesn't stand still. So about 20 years after that, we decided to look at the education system once again. And we did, conducted a comprehensive analysis of where we are and where, what it would take to remain at the world class in the next 20 years. And what we found was that although our students top the nation on many relative measures, that we have leveled off and that there are others on a steeper trajectory to overtake us. But the good news is that we are poised with strong history of K-12 educational strength, with outstanding higher education institutions, and with world-class technology and leading edge companies to really be able to make the changes we need to modernize our system and to continue to lead and to actually not just lead in relative but in actual terms. We took, um, we believe that this is very serious business and so we took it seriously when we were when we were facing a new assessment for standards that we believe are more geared towards college and career readiness. So we commissioned a study to look at the evidence that existed of how MCAS compares to PARC as an indicator of college and career readiness because that is of concern to our members and to the employers we represent. The study found without a doubt that MCAS has served its purpose but is not suited for the, for the current or the future. Um, the proficiency bar on MCAS is too low. It is evidenced by the remediation rates and the testimony that you've just heard, but also when we compare it to other career readiness, um, college and career readiness measures such as the SAT and the NAEP, uh, we found that less than half of Massachusetts 12th grade students graduate from high school ready for college in reading and in mathematics. Even raising the proficiency bar would not compensate for the content of MCAS. MCAS high school tests are not being targeted to college and career readiness. They weren't designed to measure that, and they're not, they're based on lower level material. On the 2014 test, a 10th grade student earning all of the points possible on the middle school items on the test only needed four additional points out of 60 on items aligned to high school standards for their performance to be classified as proficient. And finally, the MCAS level tests were developed at different times and it has led to inconsistency in the structure of the MCAS tests across the board. Sorry, I didn't time myself very well. No, 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 no that's, that's, that's just the room oh, warning. Okay. Oh, okay. The agenda so, button is the next one. <laughs> so our, our concern is that the high school diploma gives a false sense of readiness and that PARC has the promise to be the test that we need. We're convinced it's time to move beyond MCAS to a modern testing system that not only re measures readiness, but actually enables it. PARC is not a magic wand, but it is one tool that, can be, that has been tested for two years and that for which we have the benefit of experiences in other PARC states to know where we need to continue to develop it and improve it. It's the direction we need to go. The cost of starting over would probably be prohibitive. Concerns about time on testing are shared by employers. We wanna make sure that the time is spent on the right test, on one that is consistent with the instruction and curriculum and gives us honest measures of student performance. According to the Georgetown Center for Education and the Workforce, Massachusetts has more online jobs requiring a college degree, 63% of listings, than any other state in the nation. We also top the country with 72% of our jobs requiring a post-secondary credential by 2018. Right now, according to the Department of Higher Ed, there are six jobs for every one technical, technical or computer science associates or credential or certificate degree holder, and there are 17, 17 for every BA holder. Mark Kerouac from Bay State Health and Larry DeRose um, can give more examples which are common to our members and to Springfield Business Leaders for Education, of which they are both members. Thank you. 
Uh, well, good afternoon and thanks for having us here. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of Bay State Health. We're a five hospital system that delivers care in 70 different locations up and down the Pioneer Valley. We employ 12,000 team members and are by far the largest employer in western Massachusetts. Uh, the great majority of those jobs are good jobs with benefits, but they require high levels of education and training. Uh, in order to sort of ensure ourselves uh, a ready workforce, we've developed a number of pipeline programs and have partnered with STCC, Greenfield Community College, Holyoke Community College, AIC, Springfield College, uh, Elms, uh, Bay Path University, and Tufts, and have recently announced a new partnership to bring a branch medical school to UMass Worcester uh, here to Springfield. We have hundreds of trainees in over 25 health professions uh, and invest over $30 million a year in our educational and research missions. However, uh, I've been consistently distressed to hear how often remedial training, remedial reading and math is required, which eats away at curriculum time and the preparation of some of these healthcare workers. Often over a third of the students are uh, needing to uh, access remedial math or reading uh, after secondary school. Um, I'm not an educator, and so I'm not going to even attempt to distinguish between MCAS and PARC, um, but I have had a 20-year career in healthcare quality and performance improvement, uh, and I firmly believe that if uh, a system is going to get better, one needs to have measurement and one needs to have standards. Um, and even taking a break of a few years, I believe, is a bad idea. Uh, back in the early 90s, when I was a young physician, uh, I got in on the ground floor of the quality and safety movement in healthcare. Before that, whatever a doctor said was quality care, what counted as quality care. Um, I got involved in the early days of measurement uh, and profiling of physicians, and many of them felt that the measurements were either uncomfortable or unfair, uh, that they certainly were less than perfect. Um, however, it was an iterative process of refining measures uh, and continuing uh, a determined uh, attempt to measure and improve, which has today given the public a much better idea of what quality and safe health care is all about. Uh, so my plea to you uh, folks would be to maintain your focus on measurement and standards because we very much need the system to get better. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to meet with all of you this afternoon. I'm Larry DeRose, founder of Surtech Medical Systems, located right here in East Long Island. We manufacture complex medical devices like this implantable blood pump. It's placed inside of the body and is connected to the patient's diseased heart to provide life support and an ambulatory quality of life while waiting for a heart transplant. This is one of the most complex medical devices in the world. STEM, which everybody has heard about, is what makes this possible. It's a perfect example of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics at work to save people's lives. Today, we employ 106 people in East Long Island. 50 to 60 percent of this workforce are technicians who are high school graduates. 30% of these new applicants come into Surtech to apply for jobs without any technical training after their high school graduation. This is a sample of the work instructions to build this pump and components of this pump. This is a small sample, it's only 11 pages, there's over 100 pages of complex detailed instructions to build this device. It's full of charts, pictures of test equipment, and instructions on how to build the device. So think about this. 30% of our applicants are coming in after high school and we're looking at them for the possibility of training them to make the most sophisticated medical devices in the world. To screen new applicants, we kind of have formed our own career readiness form. It's a simple one page, nine questions. And this determines if the applicant has the essential skills to be considered an applicant. So guess what? 
50% of the applicants fail this simple exam, 50%. They fail because of inadequate reading, math, and comprehension skills. And those are the skill sets required to successfully read and understand, comprehend the documentation necessary to build these devices. Even basic writing skills are woefully inadequate as evidenced by their struggle to complete a legible application form. These sobering statistics provide to us convincing evidence that current high school graduates are absolutely not career ready. New assessments that measure critical thinking, communication and problem solving skills that many applicants lack are essential for companies like Certec to have confidence that our schools are educating students for today's high tech workforce. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Question? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Linda, will we make sure we all get a copy of the report if we don't have it yes. today? Yes. Um, we sent them all to you when well, they came out, so we have have copies. Okay. And, my and they're here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Susan Buchanan and Nancy Farrell. Susan Buchanan from Chicopee and Nancy Farrell from West Springfield. Yeah, I didn't sign up this week. I'm Nancy Farrell. Do you want to? No, I'm all set. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Valerie Anier, Anier, Gordon Smith, and Michael Fredette. specifically around our districts. Can't hear her, unfortunately. Turn the microphone. Turn it off. Just turn it. Right. How about now? Hello? Why don't you switch? Try that one. Is this one working? Oh, yeah. There we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so we want to thank you for allowing us to share feedback from our district's perspective. We piloted PARC this year, and so we have formulated our feedback with respect to our experiences. And you're all from East Long Meadow, right? Yes, sorry. So my name is Valerie Anier. I'm the Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment for the District. And with me is Superintendent Gordon Smith and Michael Fredette, who is the Principal of Maple Shade Elementary School. So East Long Meadow Public Schools participated in PARC from grades 3 through 8, and we took the paper and pencil portion of the assessment. We've organized our feedback in three categories, what went well, what was challenging, and then just some additional comments. We've condensed our feedback to some of the more salient points in an effort to stay within our time limit, uh, but Superintendent Smith and Michael may pick up where I, where I leave off. You're gonna notice, um, and, and also we're willing to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. You'll notice that our what went well category seems um, condensed and, and small and concise. However, we're hoping that you see the significance of the few but powerful statements in that section. And then conversely, you'll, you'll notice that our what was challenging is relatively um, extensive, but many of those challenges that we faced were more around te technical aspects of assessment uh, administration and uh, preparing for that. We would like to suggest that if Massachusetts decides to adopt PARC fully, that those technical aspects of the administration that you'll hear about, among others, are taken into consideration and can and should be revised to support schools in managing the administration of the assessments. So to move on to what went well, uh, one of our largest positive outcomes for implementing PARC was that our staff had worked tirelessly for four years in implementing the new frameworks in Massachusetts. While this work was already underway, 
PARC accelerated our implementation uh, by giving us the opportunity to fully align our curriculum and embed the instructional shifts called for by those standards. School leadership at Birchland Park Middle School stated that PARC upped the ante for rigor in our classrooms. At all grade levels, released test items and assessment blueprints made the standards come to life for staff by providing concrete examples of what student expectations were. The level of depth of the questioning that we experienced with the, with the sample questions affirmed our strong teachers' beliefs and in instructional practices. So it's few but powerful. And then uh, what was challenging is a bit more lengthy. Uh, but again, we feel that these are mostly technical aspects that through the revision could be um, improved upon. We feel there are too many days of testing um, and too many sessions. The state requirements in addition to PARC and MCAS further complicate the feeling of staff of over-testing. Uh, there's RTI systems in place where you have universal screening, you have progress monitoring, uh, common assessments being developed for district-determined measures and standards-based assessments that are formative, regression testing for special education students to guide further uh, intervention with, with students. The timeline of the state assessments interferes with district formative test, uh, of testing windows. Excuse me. Timed sessions were a significant concern for us. Our students, for example, in one building, our fifth grade students from one school, 12% were unable to complete the ELA performance-based assessment. Students were noticeably upset, which leads us to the question of, on a criterion reference test, why time the students? We're especially concerned with that timing aspect around the writing component. The requirement of PARC of only allowing licensed educators to proctor the assessment made it incredibly difficult to meet the student IEP accommodations, as well as led to an overall feeling of shutting down the building in order to test. To give you a couple of concrete examples, teachers from classrooms that were not tested needed to be pulled out of the classroom to become test proctors, leaving highly qualified paraprofessionals but not licensed teachers to then teach classes of students. Um, and so, well, that speaks for itself. Another example would be guidance counselors not being able to service students because they were completing the arduous task of getting ready to give the assessment. An example would be that they had to complete the PNP, or personal needs profile, for every student, which was unwieldy. Furthermore, at the district level, um, there was no clearly structured assistance for us when parents took a political stance and decided to opt out of the assessment. Supervising the students who opted out became an issue. Should I take it? That's, that's my timer? No. Oh, all right. I can <laughs> say, that's do you want morning. to say more and then you get more? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a for additional feedback, and then my colleagues will add further comments. Uh, we appreciated that during the spring, we want to make sure we acknowledge our appreciation that during the spring administration of PARC, that uh, districts were called upon, as well as students who took the assessment from all states who administered PARC for some input, and that that input then resulted in revisions that were being made. Um, for example, the testing sessions have already been pared down for next year. So we appreciate that responsiveness to feedback from the field to refine uh, the assessment tool. So I actually I'm going to interrupt with a question because we've heard an opposite uh, view, which is that the testing limits were great because with MCAS there aren't any, and so sometimes it just goes way longer than is actually necessary to assess a child. Yeah, it, and so it's two sides of the same issue is. seen in a very different way. So you obviously had a different conclusion. Could I you? think, yeah, I'm sorry. I think primarily, I'm going to turn it to Michael, who is the building principal who um, was at that school. I think primarily the writing components, which call for digging back into a text, having textual evidence, being able to support your your arguments or your, your thesis with um, strong textual support requires um, more time. I think there's probably uh, an opportunity to have both some time sessions as well as untime sessions. If I, if I may add to that yeah, answer, um, specifically the writing portion, the ELA portion, when you put a time limit on it, 
you're actually in contradiction of how we teach the writing process. And so that was something that, uh, although uh, you mentioned with MCAS, certainly there were um, sessions that went for students well beyond uh, the recommendation for the time length. It's in direct contradiction for these students who are new writers, uh, actually eager to express themselves, and then the time limit is set, and now they have not finished, they have not revised. So that was one of That's very helpful clarification. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to say, experiencing this in the building firsthand, it seemed like it was a it was a huge disappointment on both the student level and the teacher level because of the time and the tenacity that goes into the instruction to get students to achieve to the expectations that we set every day for them. And then at the big moment when you have that high stakes accountability test in front of them and the children are working incredibly hard to say, what do you mean I ran out of time? I, I've never had to experience this before in the classroom. I've always had time to finish and do my best work. And it was just the performance based component at ELA, particularly in fifth grade more than the other classes uh, the third and fourth seem to finish um, within the allotted time because the fifth graders have have, have greater skill at that age level um, and so that was problematic we did count 12 percent of our students were unable to to, to finish in the allotted time and that's really helpful yeah so i interrupted you to so pick up where you want okay um i think actually mrs anir uh, gave a, a pretty clear synopsis of most of our feedback from the district perspective i would just offer a couple points um, we certainly wanted to be a part of looking at park and we piloted a year ago with smaller uh, groups in each of our buildings piloting it and grades three through eight took the paper and pencil test uh, this school year. Uh, and so we're, we're eagerly looking forward to how our students are doing against the new standards. With that said, paper and pencil was a key choice for us because even as a suburban district where, with a community that does support education, making sure that we have the technology to assess all of our students' grades three through 11, let's say, someday, uh, is still a very daunting task. And with the technology readiness tool that came out last summer, we certainly were somewhere around the 60% range of being ready, but we're not there and we're probably not going to be there. Even with a reinvigorated uh, technology renewal process in town for probably the next two to three years, maybe more. As we know, fiscal challenges change year to year. So from a district perspective, that's something that I think uh, hopefully the state would look at and see how do we help all districts in meeting that technology component of this. Is that mostly a networking issue or a, or no, a device a issue or a business network's support network's issue? quite robust. It's more of a device issue. Uh, if we devote all our devices during the testing windows to testing, that means in non-testing classrooms, there are no devices to infuse technology into daily instruction. It, so do I have a moment to say Please. one more thing about technology in, in the testing environment? So we were very happy to have the paper pencil option. option we were, and I can, as we said in, in the prior statement that uh, we were, the students were ran out of time, I can imagine that time would be even more of an issue if they were to have to type their responses, especially at the elementary level. So the, um, a year ago, not just this past fiscal year, the year prior, we took part in the, what was offered as the state pilot. Um, and we, we took part in the pilot for computer-based testing. Um, and because of how that went, we decided to go paper pencil this past year. Uh, it didn't go well at the student level at the moment of the test either. So there were additional components to that where you had to take away from classroom instruction time to actually train the students to take the test on the computer. So it was more instructional time to how did they um, navigate the park icons, how did they navigate the park system. We had to gather all of our students and schedule the building to do these tutorials. So it was sort of like running children through professional development seminars. Um, so that didn't really feel well for us at the building level two years ago. So last year we did paper pencil as well. And the icons are all very different for how you answer an item in the box, particularly for a mathematics 
um, entry, there were icons that students needed to learn how to use, and it was the first time ever anybody has experienced these icons. So that was challenging. Again, we thank you for the opportunity thank to you. provide feedback. We did, we're willing to stay if you have questions for us. Oh, that was very helpful. Oh, very helpful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to the public testimony components. Okay, uh, as I said, we'll call up groups of uh, three at a time. Um, the buzzer is a reminder at 30 seconds. So two and a half minutes in, you have 30 seconds left. Please try to mind the time. So we'll start with uh, Tracy O'Connell Novick, Carolyn Garrett, and Donna Calorio. Please come up and then uh, introduce yourselves. One at a time. And remain through the.